Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. And uh, we are continuing in a, a series of messages that I've been doing, trying to unravel the biblical prophecies that we have been applying to future tense that have been fulfilled 2,000 years ago. Not to say that things do not continue on and, and still there are prophecies within the scriptures that are yet to be fulfilled. But in many cases, uh, a lot of the prophecies were fulfilled. And I have myself, like so many of you, have put so many of these prophecies in the, uh, the future, especially in the book of Zechariah, chapter 8, chapter 11. Uh, you know, a lot of these uh, really, really, really been putting, put into the future. I have on the screen for you right now, though, this is uh, the city of Jerusalem, a, a, a painting done depicting 70 AD when Jerusalem was sieged by Titus, the Roman gen general. Uh, he's actually the son of uh, 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 the former, uh, gosh, where is it there? Let me see if I got it in here. Ves Vespian, I believe is his name. Uh, his father, who, yeah, v uh, Vespasian, who had returned to Rome ultimately to be proclaimed the next emperor and left his son Titus to finish the war. Titus began the siege of Jeru Jerusalem in 66 CE. And by the way, that siege did not end until around 73 AD. So course of about seven years uh, this war went on to see, uh, and actually that was at Masada, where in 73, they, you know, 70 AD, they conquered uh, Jerusalem, but in 73, Masada fell. And of course, the, the Jews that were there committed suicide. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of people look at Jerusalem and they say, well, you know, Jerusalem is supposed to be the light of the world. Well, it was. Uh, that's exactly what it was when Jesus Christ came. He was the light of the world. He constantly told his apostles, um, you're a candle that's set on a hill. And uh, so he clearly was showing the evidence that they were fulfilling this scripture. Even the law going out of Jerusalem, something that is being put right now in the future by many uh, teachers today. So I'm not here to throw uh, my kindred under the bus when I'm saying the things that I'm saying, but I'm trying to get uh, my own people as well as uh, Gentile believers to recognize the fact of uh, scripture being fulfilled and the fact that the best thing we can do to help Israel today is to get the gospel of Jesus Christ to every Jewish believer there, there, believer there is, and not vice versa, not to put the people back underneath the law. That is the worst thing we can do. All right, now we're going to be focusing on a couple of scriptures here. We're going to be looking at Luke 21, specifically verse 24, and then we're going to be going into the book of Romans, uh, specifically chapter 11, verse 25. And these two verses are verses I know that have really hinged on a lot of question in people's minds. Uh, actually, was still hinging on my mind until I really prayerfully looked at this. And I'm just going to read both verses there, and then we're going to go into the depths of this uh, today so that it might be more of a blessing to you. It says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. All right, and then again in Romans, when Paul is speaking here, he said, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. All right, in both cases, when we look at these verses here, it appears to be that, that there's supposed to be some type of space of time where God is dealing with Gentiles, and then after he's done dealing with Gentiles, if you're looking at this in a literal translation verse here, uh, not literal, but in the literal sense of the way it's been uh, translated, and, and then after this is all done, well, then the Jews will suddenly recognize who Jesus Christ is. I have followed that same scenario for many, many years, believing that as well. And then, especially in light of the fact of all these prophecies, whether it be Zechariah in chapter 8, uh, they take a hold of the skirt of him that is a Jewish man, actually the wing, Bikanaf, Ishuhudi. That's not in the plural, that is in the singular, but so many 
of uh, uh, my friend, I shouldn't even say friends, but fellow believers like you have Shapira that like to point out to the Imcham right there uh, on your screen and, and blue that I highlighted there. They like to point to this as, oh, it's in the plural. It's in the plural. It's in the plural. I've explained this over and over and over because the book of Acts actually is the fulfillment of those things there. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. All right, house of Israel. Notice that. Don't forget the house of Israel here. We're going to be talking about these things tonight. Even how Jesus said, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus is on earth and he's saying, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Telling his apostles, right? He also says to the woman there that wants to have her child healed that, you know, it's not me for me to cast the children's bread, the dogs. He says, I am not sent, but into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What? I thought everybody is looking for the house of Israel in this day. Oh my gosh. So it's very interesting, I think, what we're going to get into today. Uh, and it's all going to go right back to 70 AD. You're going to really find out some amazing things, uh, I believe. And so I wanted to kind of cap over the whole scenario before we get started so it might be a better blessing for you. So you kind of know where we're going. So let's back up. We are in Luke 21. I want to start up here around verse 14. Now, this is kind of similar to that of what Jesus says in Matthew 24. So just keep that in mind. Settle it therefore in your hearts, Jesus says, not to meditate before what you shall answer. All right, let me say, so maybe I should, yeah, I'm sorry, I should have gone up to verse 10. Then said he unto them, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilence and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these things, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Now, Jesus is talking right there to his own right there that were following him at that time and saying this was going to happen to them. He said they would see the signs of great earthquakes, divers places, famines, pestilence, and fearful sights and great signs there shall be from heaven. Do you know that this is recorded in history? I didn't even know that. Uh, we, I mean, the obvious one should be the famine. I mean, go back to Rome there, right? 70 AD, seven years Jerusalem was under siege. Some people think it was only, you know, from 66 to 70 when the temple was destroyed. No, no. They also had to take Masada as well. So for seven years, from, from 66 AD to 73 AD, they were under siege. Seven years. Now we talk about a seven-year tribulation out of Revelation, right? I don't know. I'm just, just saying it's kind of interesting. Seven years is actually spoken of there. All right. But then the earthquakes, right? Looky here. This is interesting for you. Uh, right there. Earthquakes, for example, this is on world history. I just happened to look this up. And you can look at each one of these individually. But if you'll notice who writes about these ones, right? For example, the, uh, the Lycus Valley and cities of per uh, Pergamum, Laodicea and Colossus destroyed by earthquakes. Tacticus, Annals, uh, in the uh, 1427, uh, I guess it's the volume of the book that he writes there, writes about that. On the 5th of February of 63 AD, the city of Pompeii was nearly engulfed by an earthquake. In 79, it would be completely buried by uh, Vesvesius, uh, would be completely buried. Now, that was written by Vesvesius, Tacticus, Annals, uh, and also Josephus uh, wrote in his book of Antiquities, uh, chapter 20, uh, paragraph, or, or section 7, uh, maybe 2. Then we have a sudden eruption of the sea inundated Lycia, a port city in Turkey, in 60 AD, 68 AD. Then we had leading citizens ruined, whole communities devastated, providing uh, for Vitellius banquets and 60,000 soldiers en route to Rome. That was in 69 AD. All right. So here we had multiple earthquakes, I've, I've, and, and not to mention the biblical ones that are spoken of too in 30 AD. 
Uh, you have here, there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Uh, we have the place where the meeting was shaken and they, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. We have uh, uh, earthquake that the foundations of the prisons were shaken for Paul. Um, and that was well after 30 AD. We don't know exactly what the date was on that there. But it's just interesting that this website right here, prophecyhistory.com, uh, cites some of this. And I know, uh, as my wife was sharing with me too, that a lot of the things we have written right here are recorded. Now, of course, like I said, the famines is obvious. They were eating their own children and stuff in Jerusalem at the time because their food was cut off by the Roman soldiers. And so, and then there's a lot of writings too about uh, the great signs in heavens and stuff. We find this in the early church father's writings. I didn't put all that together. Just want to kind of point this out. A lot of these things actually were happening back then and we totally forget about it. We look at it today because all the things that are happening today and so everybody's saying, oh my gosh, we got all the earthquakes in diverse places. Maybe we do have a repeat of history. Not saying we don't, good possibility. But we got to look at what he says here. But before all these, these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons and, and being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Now, I think it's very important that we look at this here. All right. They're delivering you up to the synagogues. What does that tell us? Until Jerusalem is destroyed, the Pharisee, dynasty or the Hasmonean dynasty that was really strongly ran by the Pharisees controlled the believers very much so and it shall turn you uh, and it shall turn you for a testimony settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. We saw that betrayal even while Jesus was yet alive. If you think about it, remember the, the man that was born blind that was begging and Jesus healed him and his parents were so fearful they would be thrown out of the synagogue. They didn't dare say a word. That's right. They didn't say anything. They, in fact, they said to, to, the, to the Pharisees, well, he's of age, ask him. Right? That's, that's a form of betrayal. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish, and your patience possesses you, your souls. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Jesus is not talking to us, friends. He's talking to the, his, the, the disciples that he had 2,000 years ago. When you shall see Jerusalem pass with armies, then know the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let with them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of the uh, depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter in there into it. In other words, if you're out in the country, you see it. Don't go back to Jerusalem. You know your days of buying and selling are over. And if you're in there, get to the mountains. Isn't it interesting that Rome actually allowed the Jews that lived in the countryside that were farmers and stuff to stay. That's, that's who your Palestinians are today. Not all your Palestinians, about 50% of the Palestinians are from other nations like Jordan and Egypt and things like that. But 50% of your Palestinians, and this was also known by the early settlers in Israel back in, when Israel became a nation, Ben-Gurion actually went out to try to proselyte to those Palestinians because he knew that they were crypto-Jews. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. All right, did you notice what Jesus just said? In verse 20, and when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is not. Jesus says, for these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. 
So when we do have messianic ministers saying, uh, you got to pray and repent for 70 AD. Jesus said, this is the days of vengeance, which is to, which was written to be fulfilled. Woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And we already know the history records it, that they were eating their own children. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, after I've explained this, maybe verse 24 actually begins to make sense. Jerusalem would be trodden down, all right, Trom trampled. Let's look at that. Let me let me take you to Luke, just for for uh, this is what I use when I'm just wanting to deal with basic translation type things. Uh, actually, I think it's chapter 21. Um, let's go back. Yeah, 21 verse 24. I want to just show you something here. So we kind of look at these things, right? Trodden down. There we go right there. To trample. Literally or figuratively. Figuratively. All right? Once Rome had completed their work, their mission, when they were trying to put down the insurrection, which granted, I agree from the very beginning, when the Maccabees made the agreement, the peace agreement with Rome, is the worst thing they ever did. I agree with that as well. It backfired on them. But it also, Rome was also used to bring about judgment upon Jerusalem because of the idolatry. All right, this is what they had gotten involved in. We're going to get into that when we speak about where Paul talks about this in Romans. All right. But the trodden down is they were trampled. So when the Gentiles, all right, and, and let's just look at each one of these here. Jerusalem shall be trodden down. They shall be trampled by the Gentiles. Why doesn't it say the Romans? Because Titus didn't just use the Roman military. Vaspian, he was not able to put down the rebellion alone. He tried. Now, he did have to go back because he was being uh, brought up to be an emperor of Rome, but he was not as successful as his son. His son went back and his son gathered up the armies out of Turkey, out of Syria, and all those nations there, all the ones that hated the Jews, and he gathered all those nations together and then went in there, and that's how he conquered Jerusalem. But between Jerusalem and Masada, it took seven years to put this put the rebellion down. So they were trampled by the nations. That's why it's Gentiles, plural. And that's why it's not just Rome. Until the times, the time, the space of time that it would take, in other words, that is set or proper time of those nations be fulfilled. It has nothing to do with the fact until Gentiles all get saved and then God's going to turn back to the Jews. Okay? Salvation is for, for the Jewish people and for not just Jews, but for every Israelite there is. It was for, for them from the day that Christ came until he gave his life on the cross and even until the world comes to a complete end. The salvation of Israel has never ceased to be. So the fullness of the Gentiles is when they fulfilled carrying out the judgment of Almighty God upon Jerusalem. That's what it is. All right. Now, let's take a look over here in the book of Romans. Now, Paul in verse 25 said that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles 
become in. Actually, it would be better to translate that until the fulfillment of the Gentiles has entered. He's actually speaking to the exact same thing because for Paul, this was still a future event as well. And that the blindness was going to stay upon those Jews until they, until what? Until that system of idolatry that they had turned the law of God into was destroyed. In other words, it made it difficult to win Jews to Christ because they had them bound. These rabbis and sages kept their own people bound. I mean, look, let me just show you. Thrown out synagogue. Actually, I think it's put out. Let me let me do it right. Let me do it right. It's not thrown, put out. It'd be put out of the synagogues, right? All right, now maybe if I pluralize it, it'll make it even better. But here we go right here. John chapter 9, verse 22. These spake of his parent because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogues. If they declared that Jesus was the Messiah, they'd throw him out. In chapter 12, verse 42 of the uh, New Testament, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. All right, let me see if pluralizing the word synagogues helps as well. Yeah, there we go. I got another one. John chapter 16, verse 2. Jesus said, they shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. <laughs> if they kill you, they think they're doing the righteous thing. That's about to repeat. That's one prophecy that's about to repeat. All right? So when Paul in the book of Romans writes this here, blindness in part has happened to Israel. That wasn't just the house of Judea, of Judah, or the house of uh, Judah, but also happened to Israel, all 12 tribes, until the fulfillment of the Gentiles had entered. And he's, quite, he's basically saying the exact same thing that Jesus said. In other words, until Titus came in and destroyed Jerusalem to where he could break up that religious sect to where they didn't have the power over the people. All right? Now, this is going to get interesting. So bear with me because there's a, I, I'm, we're going to back up now, but when we go past this here, you're going to see a beautiful thing that is written to you as Gentiles, as well as to the Jewish believers and how they should handle um, Israelites that have not yet believed because there is a mer there's mercy in this whole passage. All right, let's let's back all the way. Let me let me maybe I can do it from the bottom is easier here. A previous chapter. We're gonna to go to Romans chapter 10 first. Uh, because you kind of have to pick up in here before you go into chapter 11. But I say, did not Israel know? Okay. Wait, let's back up to verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I'll tell you something. There's some people that don't like Paul. Let me tell you why they don't like Paul. I'll tell you why they like to throw Paul under the bus. And a lot of rabbinical teachers, even like Tovia Singer, they say Paul didn't know what he was talking about. They, they say Paul says seeds instead of seed, singular, and that there was no place in the Bible where it ever says that. When the Dead Sea Scrolls, they use the word seeds, plural, two thousand more than 2,000 years ago. And, there, and every place that Tobias Singer has ever tried to debunk Paul on, I can prove that he is completely misleading people in the process of this. But this has also given a lot of power to those that are trying to go back to the law. There's a lot of push to put people under the law. Well, let me tell you something. You don't have to push too hard because in this new world order they're trying to create right now, if you continue going the way you're going, they're going to put everybody back under the law. 
And those of you that are really just wanting to be Jews and wanting to go back underneath the bondage that Israel was in, the idolatry that she was in before Christ came and freed them, you're fixing to get your chance. All right. So Paul was only showing you the truth of what it was before Israel got into idolatry. Now, many of you would probably say, but Steve, Moses gave the law. He gave Levitical law. He gave the Ten Commandments. Hey, I understand that. I'm not against that. All right. Jesus also came and said, it is, it is written, or they say of them of all time, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He quoted Levitical law. But he said, I say unto you, if your neighbor takes your coat, give him your cloak also. Whoa, 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 wait a minute now. What are you talking about? Jesus, people always say Jesus kept every bit of the law. Now, Jesus just told you not to do what the law said. Jesus showed you mercy instead of judgment. All right? That's what the law, that's what Jesus said. You have omitted the greater things, which is what? Mercy. That's what Jesus said. You omitted the greater things. They brought the woman out that was caught in the act of adultery. The very act of it. They said, Moses and the law said a woman like this should be stoned. Yeah, but it also said you're supposed to bring the guy with her. All right? But then Jesus said, totally contrary to the law, which one of you is without sin? Let him cast the first stone. Wow. But the law didn't say, oh, didn't say what Jesus just said. It just simply said, if you catch him in adultery, Israel, the children of Israel to take them out of the camp, put them out there and stone them and put sin out of the, out of the, out of the camp, right? But Jesus said, which one of you is without sin? Let him cast the first stone. And when there was no one there, all of them guilty, they dropped their stones and walked away. The woman's left alone, and what, what happens? Jesus says, where are your accusers? She said, they've all left, Lord. He said, neither do I accuse you. And then he didn't say, go off or, you know, two turtle doves, a bullock, and a goat, and a, and a camel, and this or that. He said, go and sin no more. Mercy. See, this is what God was saying. I desire mercy more than sacrifice. Now, God, sure, God put in the law there. He gave them something until the coming of Christ that because Israel wanted the law. Um, I believe the Ten Commandments, though, were in place even before Moses came along. We see evidence of it. We can see going back to the time when Abraham was worried about his wife being taken from him and that they would kill him for her. Because why? They, well, you weren't supposed to take the wife unless, you're, unless the husband was dead. So they figured they'd kill him. You know, a lot of things like that we can see. Now, of course, Moses did give the Ten Commandments. And, uh, and no, that's not Noahide laws either. Noahide laws, they add to the word of God. They have sub-laws that go with it, to behead Christians for idolatry because they interpret what those laws mean. This is where you're headed if you don't accept the grace of Jesus Christ. Let's move on. I don't want to waste too much time here. But I, but, uh, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words into the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and said, I was found of them that sought me not, and I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Now, real quick, I'm just going to point out something to you. In the book of Isaiah, where this is quoted from in verse 20, is actually taken from Isaiah chapter 65. And I find this interesting here. Just goes to show, I was going to just share with it just so we could look at it, right? But I just wanted to show you how corrupted new translations are becoming 
in order to try to give preeminence to the system that was once destroyed by Titus. They translate, you know, because see, over here in the book of Romans, chapter 10, but Isaiah says very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not, and I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. Right? I was found of them that sought me not is really the main part. It says here, I gave access to them that asked not for me. That's so fascinating the way they translate this right here. This is where it's from. Darash. Darash, there, there, there's no, there, there's not, the, the single word gave is not even in the sentence. Ni darashti lelo sha'alu, sha'elu. All right. It, 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 I mean, you could, Darash could even be translated as the word preach, right? It has nothing to do with the word gave. The, 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 really, the better way for Darash is demanded. I was demanded upon of those that did not ask of me. And then, in reality, but Isaiah is very bold and said, I was found of them that sought me not. That's fine too. But to say I gave access to them that asked not for me, that's that's a political agenda right there. That's a political, sorry, that's a political agenda. I gave access. No, it doesn't say I gave access to them that asked not for me. I was at hand to them that sought me not. I said, behold me, behold me into a nation that was not called by my name. This, in other words, this is all the prophecy of Jesus Christ and the Gentiles believing upon him. But then he goes on to speak about Israel. I have spread out my hands all the day into a rebellious people that walk in a way that is not good, after their own thoughts. A people that provoke me to my face continually, that sacrifice in gardens and burn incense upon bricks, that sit among the graves and lodge in the vaults, that eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things is in their vessels. The stay, the say, stand by thyself, come not near me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose and a fire that burneth all the day. So now he speaks about Israel. And it's interesting because even to this day, that spirit is really not left. That it's like a Pharisaic spirit. You know, you're not to touch certain Orthodox. This is why they need the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, friends, so badly. All right, so let's move on. Both Israel, he saith, all day long, I have stretched forth my hands into a disobedient and gainsaying people. All right, now when we go into chapter 11. Then Paul begins to speak about this. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. And the reason why Paul is saying this, because as we know the story, he also was a Pharisee. Insomuch that he was on his road to kill the Christians of Damascus. Do you know why God would not allow Paul to go to the road to Damascus and kill those Christians? That's because the prophecy of Isaiah 17, where Damascus would become a ruinous heap, was prophesied for a future day. Paul would have burnt the whole city down with all the Christians in it. That's how zealous he was against them. God hath not cast away his people, we continue on, which he foreknew. Will you not what the scripture saith of Elias, speaking about Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee unto to the image of Baal. Even so, then, at the present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So even now, as we speak today, God still knows 
how many Jewish people are out there that will believe him, that would embrace the gospel. We might feel like that, especially with everything going the way it is. I mean, people are, even Christians are turning back to, to the law. Christians are going back under the bondage. Christians are going back under the yoke of the bondage of the Pharisaic spirit that Jesus came to break 2,000 years ago. The very same spirit and ungodliness that Jesus said that it was going to be judged and the Gentiles were going to come and fulfill that judgment. As we just read over in the book of Luke chapter 21. So there is a remnant according to grace. And if by grace then is it no more works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. So Paul's clarifying in verse six, it's not going to be based on the law, but of the grace of Jesus Christ and his mercy. As he said, I desired mercy. He quotes it, not sacrifice. What then Israel hath not? Obtain that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Now, what he's speaking of right here, so you understand, is there was an elect, the apostles, the 120 in the upper room, the 3,000 that were baptized, like on the day of Pentecost, etc., the different numbers that were added in. That's the elect. The rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. All right. So Israel had to fall. They had to become blind. There had to be a remnant that would believe upon him, but there also had to be a group that was blind in order to offer Christ as a sacrifice. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak unto you Gentiles, insomuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I'm magnifying mine office, Paul says here. Verse 14, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are, are my flesh and might save some of them. Notice that, some of them. Paul knows you can't save, you're not going to save everybody. It's not going to all be saved because God knows who will and who will not. For the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. What shall be the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Think about that. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Now, by the way, who is the root? Do you know Jesus Christ is that root? And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take he lest he also spare not you. Okay, in other words, we still have to be humble. Even as Gentiles, it doesn't mean that God just throws all the Jews away and all the Jews went to hell because they never, they never could see anything. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not, still in unbelief shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? 
For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. All right. Now, I find this, and I want to highlight it separately, very interesting. Blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Until the full fulfillment of the Gentiles enter. Why was that? Just like I said a moment ago when we were over here looking at these here, they shall put you out of the synagogue. Jay, the time come, they think they doeth God a service if they kill you. All right, whoop, didn't mean to do that. Uh, let me see if I go back to the history. Here we go right here. And then also we can do this one. Uh, nevertheless, John 12, 42 let me put this more in the center of the screen so you guys can see this. Among the chief rulers, also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogues. They were willfully blind. They wanted to believe, but because of the system, they could not believe. So when Paul says this, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, or until... Titus comes and destroys that system that was blocking the people from being able to believe. And so all Israel shall be saved. Okay. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Jesus Christ is that deliverer. For this is my covenant with them when I shall take away their sins. Now he's actually quoting Daniel chapter 9. And the Messiah would be cut off what? In the midst of the week, taking away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling, here's where it gets beautiful. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as you in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Now he's talking to the Gentiles. Even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. Isn't that beautiful? Even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them in all, all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. All right. In other words, the unbelief that happened to Israel, he permitted that to happen so that he could save the Gentiles. But he's also saying to you Gentiles that through your mercy, they also may obtain mercy. In other words, the, the only way that Israel can recognize that Jesus Christ is truly the Messiah is when you show mercy back to the Jewish people. When you show kindness and tell them the love of Jesus Christ. Then he says in verse 33, Oh, the depth of riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. I mean, it's true. It is so, it is so mind-boggling. In other words, God allowed the Jewish people to, 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 I mean, he didn't want them to get into idolatry. Don't get me wrong. It's not that he wanted them to go into idolatry, but through that blindness, through that system that they had, that brought Israel to a place that they could fulfill the scripture because the Messiah had to be offered as a sacrifice of the sins of the world in order to release the life that was in him. Because he, Toby, a singer, will tell you, God does not accept a human sacrifice. No, he doesn't. He doesn't want one. But Satan does. In redemption, in order to buy back mankind, there had to be a man that would not sin, that could actually keep the law and could literally walk that way, that would carry within his bosom the very life of Almighty God. All right? Because why? We notice in the book of Genesis, for example, let me let me take you to this, right? In the book of Genesis, 
when God breathes into the nostrils of Adam, okay, chapter 2, I believe it is, right? Yeah, chapter 2, right here. He says right here, he breathed in his nostrils the very breath of life, Chaim. All right? What is Chaim? Chaim is from the tree of life. Okay? The tree of life, right here, Be'ez Chaim. Actually, Be'ez Ha Chaim. All right? See that little word right there, the Chaim in blue? Exact same thing as this right here. So if the tree of life bears fruit, what is the fruit of the tree of life? It's the Chaim. So what did God breathe into Adam? Chaim. So who was doing the breathing? The tree of life was doing the breathing. Even though we know that it says uh, that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Okay, so yeah, so they formed the, you know, they formed, you know, Jehovah Elohim et Adam. And he formed him, Afar, Min Ha'adama, from the dust of the earth. He breathed in him. And he becomes what? A living soul. But now it's singularized right there, that last part there. Hey, Yod, uh, excuse me, Chet Yod Hey. That's singular. Why? Because he breathed plural because Eve was in him. That's why I've often said the beautiful types of God's promised year into this day was fulfilled through John the Baptist. What do I mean by that? All right, so let me kind of make sure I clarify this so you understand, especially if you've never heard this message before. I've got a good friend of mine, an Israeli journalist. You may listen to this message. When God breathed into Adam and he be and he became a living soul, that's chaya, all right? He's the singular part of that right there. But he put chayim in him. When Eve comes forth from Adam, she is filled with the Holy Spirit as well. She has chaya in her, that very life from the tree of life, the fruit of the tree of life. When the sin comes into the garden, God puts those angels to guard the way to the tree of life. Because God knew that if they put forth their hand, they would live in a fallen state. He could not have the children of Adam and Eve having eternal life in a fallen state because then it would give Satan eternal life and the power to live eternally and cause havoc beyond anything we could ever imagine. So when Christ came, Christ came to redeem back what was lost. He came to redeem what Adam lost. And when the Roman soldier pierced his side on the cross, the water and the blood came from his side. All right. What was that? It was the waters of life. Jesus said to the woman at the well, if you knew it was who was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink. I would give you waters that flow from the belly. He was talking about within his own soul, his own spirit. He was carrying what? He was what? He was the tree of life, the Ace Chaim. And so when his side was pierced, the blood and the water came out, just like it was in the temple. When they would offer the sacrifice, they'd pour the water to clean it off. It ran out the side of the temple, went down into the Kidron Valley. Water mixed with blood. But the animal's, the animal's life couldn't come back upon the believer that was repented, the one that was offering that sacrifice for sin. But Christ's life could come back upon him. And that's why, like God breathed upon the nostrils of Adam here and gave him that, Jesus, after the resurrection, breathed on those Jewish apostles and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And then on the Pentecost, day of Pentecost, they exactly did that. They received the Holy Ghost. All right? So that was the redemptive work. As I said, though, I was mentioning, you know, Eve received it without having that having to happen. John the Baptist also, he received the Holy Ghost while he was yet in his mother's womb at the very name of Jesus Christ caused him to receive the Holy Ghost. What was it? Again, it was the breath. When, when Mary came and brought Elizabeth the salutation, what was it? The very life of God inside of her, as her mouth spoke, the breath came out from an anointed child, the Mashiach, in the womb of Mary that caused the child in the womb of another woman to receive the Holy Ghost. 
Imagine that. These things are beyond finding out. It's beyond our understanding. But anyway, I want to share those things with you because we have to understand that redemptive work and what's going on. Now, in closing, you know, this is why I say, you, you know, the fullness of the Gentiles was just Titus carrying out the judgment of Almighty God that was prophesied in the scripture. All right. It, what did it do? It broke. It wounded the serpent. It brought the wound of the serpent. God says also here that, you know, after the fall that takes place, right? Uh, Genesis chapter three, I believe it is. You know, we find out, you know, the woman, you know, that you know, she did it and all this kind of everything. Everybody passes the buck. Right? And then God says right here, I will put enmity between thee and between the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Now, I'm not going to highlight the word they because that's totally wrong. It says, he, he shall bruise his head. All right? He, who's the he? That's the woman's seed. Is going to bruise the head of who? The serpent. And they shall bruise their heel. That's because they would be serpent in, in, in this Pharisaic dynasty that had mingled their seed back over when they were in uh, uh, Babylon. That was the serpent's children there. Jesus clearly said that they were of the wicked one. He said that they were all, no, I think it's John, but uh, Jesus says in there that you are of your father, the devil, and the works he'll do. He said, you generation of vipers, serpents, etc. right? Well, he was bruising that head. And when that final bruise came was when Titus, the Roman general, decapitated, well, didn't decapitate it, but he crushed the head of the serpent. And that's what gave the church the ability then to take the gospel into all the world. But let me back up one thing, though, just remind you, though, as I said earlier, in the book of Acts, the house of Israel had already come home. Peter says here, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. I shared with you where Jesus was already saying, right, over here in the book of Matthew, go after the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Everybody's looking for the house of Israel to come home. What, to go back underneath Talmudic rabbis? You've just learned tonight that these prophecies that Jesus spoke about, Paul spoke about in Romans was judgment brought to the Sanhedrin. It was judgment brought to the Pharisee Hasmonean dynasty to bruise the head of that system so the gospel could go forth. And it kind of reminds me now, when the Lord showed me that you would have to behead that serpent, take that serpent's head completely off. The only way that we're going to wake up Jewish people and Gentiles today of what's really going on is to decapitate their movement. If I don't decapitate that serpent, if I don't take his head off, and that was God showed me that sword in my hand, it's the word of Almighty God. If I don't take and decapitate the serpent to where the people can see what the truth of the gospel is, then the hope of salvation could be easily swallowed up by the enemy. Not to say your salvation is not, because you're believers, you already believed. I'm talking about, in other words, the thing is, is the hope of salvation for those that have a possibility to still hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and to repent for their sins. But as long as they, you have all these moving, taking people down this Pharisaic demonic system, and you have people, and maybe, like I said, maybe these guys mean well, Khan and Shapira and, and all these, uh, even this new apostolic reformation movement, these people sitting there, they, they, they think, they, 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 I believe that they, I don't say these people don't love the Lord, I believe they do love the Lord, but they don't realize Jesus brought judgment on that system, and yet you're taking the people right back underneath that, thinking that the law is going to come out of Jerusalem because of 1948, Israel becomes a nation again because the Rothschilds built it up. Friends, these are scriptures that have long been fulfilled. When you look over here and we go into, say, Zechariah chapter 8, as I brought out before, 
Yea, many peoples, my, uh, and mighty nations shall come and seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. It doesn't mean the Gentiles were coming, but yet the Gentiles did come. That was speaking about what? On chapter Acts chapter uh, 2, right? When we go back and we look at this, what was it? They were from all over the world. See? How every, every, every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. You see, these were Judeans. They, were, In other words, their ancestors were all Jews. But they were from where? Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes, Arabians. I'm not doing it in order, but you know what I mean. And who were these? These were all the house of Israel. Why? Because Jesus had already been preaching, go only into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When his apostles went abroad, they were going to those nations preaching to the house of Israel. The prophecies being fulfilled come home before the fullness of the Gentiles. Because why? The gospel was go to the Jew first, then to the Gentiles. So that scripture had to be fulfilled. The scripture had, all Israel had to hear first. And now we're seeing the fulfillment there. I hope I didn't keep you too long. I know, I know I kind of drug this out longer than I should. I trust this is a blessing to you as much as it blesses my heart. And I, I, I also, I want to thank you though. There's many of you that also helped with the, uh, the fundraising for my sister. It almost reached the goal on that. I do want to thank you for that. And I also want to just ask you, those of you that feel led in your heart and you want to support the work we do here, uh, IsraeliNewsLive.org is our website. But Danoon Institute is the way, ooh, okay. I don't know. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll quit saying this. I'm talking too much. All right, no, it's still the same way. Uh, if you want to support the ministry, Danoon Institute, that's how you would make your check if you're doing it by mail, Danoon Institute, 8297 Champions Gate Boulevard. You can also put Stephen Benoon, uh, which top of the screen there, you'll see how my name is actually spelled, B-E-N hyphen N-U-N. Uh, Danoon is the pen name I used to write books in. That's why we ended up with the name Danoon. Uh, so just so you're aware of that. But uh, you can click online and donate also right there if you want to donate online or by mail. Uh, you can also support the work we do on Patreon uh, as well. But we want to thank you for your kindness and love and support for the ministry that we do here. And I trust this broadcast has been a blessing to you as much as it was a blessing to me in discovering this wonderful information. God bless you and thank you for listening.